Hello, everyone, and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is DeSoto Brown, and this is my show entitled, How Did We Get Here? The meaning of that title is, let's look into history to see how we got to be where we are today. And when I'm talking about how we are today, I'm talking about all different aspects of our life here in the Hawaiian Islands. I work at Bishop Museum here in Honolulu. I am the curator of the archives department, and I'm also the Bishop Museum historian. The material you're going to see in this program today, however, is not from Bishop Museum, but is from my private collection. So this is a short and sweet look at how two competing companies chose to advertise Hawaii to their potential customers. And these are two competing airlines. And we're just looking at material from a specific time period from the late 1940s into the 1960s, with most of it being from the 1950s. Why am I doing this? Because I want you to see how this advertising used to look, how it evolved, how it enticed people to come here, to pay money to come to this place. And while these two companies are in competition with each other, they overlap a great deal in how their advertising illustrations appear. And it's because they are advertising to the same clientele, potential clientele, which is American citizens who are coming to another part of the United States based on the time period that we're that I'm talking about. So the first picture that we see here is from a Pan American World Airways advertising brochure from the late 1940s. And this is very typical of what I'm going to be showing you. This is artwork. It's not a photograph. And artwork for commercial purposes has an advantage in that when you're trying to create a mood and you're trying to get people to want to do something or to come someplace, you're able to manipulate the vision more thoroughly if you're not even dealing with reality at all. So this is the work of an artist. And in the background, of course, you see the Hawaiian Islands to make it clear that this is what we're talking about. But the picture of the woman is interesting. She could either be interpreted as representing people of Hawaii because she's got a slightly darker complexion. She has dark hair. She has brown eyes. She's surrounded by tropical flowers. But at the same time, maybe she's an American tourist. So either way, she's trying to appeal to whatever someone might think when they look at this picture. That's what I'm talking about that commercial art can do that a photograph cannot do. Okay, let's talk now about the two companies whose particular materials we're going to be looking at. On the left, you see a luggage sticker for Pan American World Airways, and on the right, for United Airlines. These are paper stickers issued in the 1950s given out to people who flew on the airlines, and you could put these stickers on your luggage as decorations to show that you had been to these exotic places. And that was something that people did a lot of at that time. It was, a, it was a point of pride that you were able to show others that you'd been to a lot of different places. On the left, the Pan American sticker in the oval is using a, uh, an, a layout which Pan American used for a bunch of different places that it flew to. Always with the same oval, always with the same writing around the edges, but in the center, a different picture. On the right, United Airlines was at that time purely a domestic airline. It did not fly to international locations. So they didn't have to, Hawaii was one of its major markets. So they didn't have to specify that they went to Hawaii because that's pretty much the only, one of the only places that they did go in addition, of course, to a lot of different places in North America. Now notice again, even though these, these are competing airlines, they've both are using the same image to designate the Hawaiian Islands as a destination, and that is Diamond Head. And that shows you that at this time in the 1950s, lots of people in the USA knew Diamond Head was a symbol of the Hawaiian Islands and that Waikiki Beach was in the foreground of this view of Diamond Head. So again, 
even though they're advertising to the same people, they're not differentiating themselves very much because they're both using the same image. And here's another comparison. United Airlines picture on the left and a Pan American picture on the right. But they both have a lot of similarities. Both of them are showing the airplane in the background. And this, in fact, is the same airplane coming from the same manufacturer that both airlines are using. They're putting their plane in there to show you how modern they are, how up to date they are. But in the foreground, both of them are showing you a well-dressed, sophisticated looking young couple that, again, looks upscale. They're not just poor people, but then of course, at the time, air travel was expensive, so not a lot of people could fly on airplanes at the time. So the people who did tended to be better off. This young couple, in both cases, both dressed up. And in those days, people did, in fact, dress up this way to go on airplanes. In reality, the man's wearing a tie, the woman is wearing a suit. But even though they are dressed somewhat formally, there is a level of informality in that they're interacting with Hawaiian people and they're both, both women are wearing lei because they've been greeted and the Hawaiian people are also shown in this picture as the ones welcoming the well-dressed tourists by demonstrating first their aloha for them by giving them flower lei. And second, there also are singers, musicians, and dancers present as well. And in fact, at Honolulu Airport at that time, sometimes musicians and hula dancers were hired to greet airplanes. So this is not too far off from what really was going on. But again, it's a fantasy view created by commercial artists. And again, even though these are competing airlines, they're both showing you, interestingly, the same scene. Now let's talk a little bit about the specifics of these two airlines. Pan American World Airways got started in the 1920s. And in fact, the 1920s was when commercial air travel began. And it's also when airlines first began in, in a very crude state at that time, as they gradually were consolidated by smaller airlines, either being bought out or uh, joining up with another bigger one. Pan American started out again, late 1920s, and by the 1930s was expanding very rapidly and really pushing technology and pushing the technology of air travel. And in 1936, Pan American was the first airline to establish regular passenger flights from California to the Hawaiian Islands. And those first airplanes, those first flights, took 17 to 19 hours, which sounds grueling to us today. But the planes were large. There was a lot of room. You could walk around. You could sleep in a berth, etc. And it was considerably faster than being on a ship for five days to get here. Those early flights were very expensive. Very few people traveled by air before World War II because of the expense. And it also was still something of an unproven technology, so some people were a little bit leery of it. At the time, that flight from California to Honolulu was the longest span that any airline was able to fly. That was the limits of technology. When Pan Am first started doing these flights, it was just a segment on their full Pacific flight routes. They did have to stop repeatedly en route at different islands, but you could fly from Pan, on Pan American all the way from California to China. That was astonishing to people in the 1930s that you could do that. And it took several days to do it, but again, on a ship, it would take weeks. Pan American had an exclusive to fly to Hawaii from 1936 to 1947. And since they didn't have any competition, they really didn't have a lot of reasons to improve their service or cut their fares, improve their airplanes or anything like that until something came along, which I'll say in just a minute. But one other thing to point out too is that Pan American established various terms that were associated with it exclusively 
the people of the time immediately understood meant just Pan American World Airways. And that was the use of the word clipper. All of Pan American's planes were called clippers. The word clipper originally comes from the 1800s, and it described a particularly fast type of sailing ship. And clippers gradually got displaced as ships by uh, the introduction of steamships. So ships that were powered by engines were much faster than clipper ships that just depended upon the wind to blow into their sails. However, there was a certain level of romance attached to this 18th century word, 19th century word, excuse me. And so Pan American adapted it for its planes. And so on both of these pieces from the 1950s, you see that they are Pan American planes are described as clippers. And everybody at the time understood that that meant a Pan American plane specifically. You'll be there in hours by clipper, or you could go on a clipper air cruise. That meant Pan American. In 1947, as I mentioned, Pan American finally got some competition and the federal government that year gave authorization to United Airlines to start flying to the Hawaiian Islands. Once that happened, Pan American was spurred to one, lower its fares, two, replace its old planes with newer and faster planes, and three, to start advertising Hawaii specifically as a destination, which they had not done up until that time. Once they had competition, they did. This very complicated, colorful, ornate piece of art that you're looking at right now is an in-flight menu given out on United Airlines flights, and it's by a man named Joseph Feher. Feher was from Hungary, and he immigrated to the United States. He ended up in Chicago, which is where United Airlines was based. He did commercial artwork of Hawaii for United Airlines. And then interestingly, he moved here to Honolulu. He went to work for Bishop Museum, where I work today. And he spent the last years, decades of his life working here with a lot of Hawaiian subjects. Well, this artwork he did before he lived here. And in the center of it, the focus of it is the ku figure, the ku ki'i, or tiki, as it, he would be called in American culture. The ku figure that you see here has always been on exhibit in Hawaiian Hall in Bishop Museum. He still is today. And because he's the best known ancient Hawaiian carving, he's the one that people have copied repeatedly. And he shows up in innumerable places in popular culture. Well, here he is again. Some of the motifs that you see repeated in advertising from this time period, and again, for Pan American and United, are beautiful women, but not just beautiful women, beautiful Hawaiian or dark-skinned women. And of course, everybody here who is dark-skinned is not pure Hawaiian. Um, everybody is tends to be mixed. So these women are not, you know, for the American consumer, they're not going to be knowing what what ethnic background somebody who looks like this is. They're just going to know that she looks a beautiful, she looks exotic, she has dark skin, but she's also desirable in a way that in American popular culture at that time, other dark skinned people were not considered. There was, this is a very racially charged time period we're talking about in the USA. But people in the Hawaiian Islands were considered to be exotic in a beautiful and desirable way. So that's why this woman is being used on the cover of a menu for Pan American World Airways. And the focus obviously is on her wearing a lei, wearing exotic flowers in her hair. Those are gardenias. But behind her is a little Pan American plane. So you know this is associated with Pan Am. And you also see Hawaiian women or native women or exotic women on United Airlines material as well. And these are all from the 1950s. And the, uh, the item on the left is a brochure. And the other two are baggage tags. And these are just souvenir pieces that when you checked in for a flight to Hawaii, or if you were leaving on a flight back to the United States, the United Airlines ticket agent would give you these for free that you could put on your bag. That didn't on the back it was you could write your name and address, etc., for identification. 
But again, like with those stickers that I showed you at the beginning of this, they were there for decoration and to show people you'd been on a trip to this far off exotic and desirable place. There are a variety of uses of Hawaiian culture in this airline material from this time period. And not just airline material, but all kinds of advertising stuff for, for tourism to attract tourists to come to the Hawaiian Islands. These two Pan American brochures show you what I'm talking about. On the left, a luau scene. And by this time, a number of places were staging luau for tourists, particularly in Waikiki. So that by the 1950s, tourists were being at luau were being advertised to them. Uh, one of them, one of the main ones being at the Queen Surf restaurant in Waikiki, but they were also staged at other places as well. Uh, Don the Beachcomber restaurant at the international, what's now the international marketplace as well. And on the right hand side, a brochure that shows a man dressed in feather garments, traditional of traditional Hawaiian culture, of course, in this case, very abstracted. And if you look behind him, there is a canoe that there are other figures wearing what are supposed to look like feather cloaks, but in fact, excuse me, feather capes, but they're of non-real colors. One is pink and one is blue and one is kind of orange yellow. Um, that I think is a reference to the court that was created every year for Aloha Week, which began in 1947. And the figures in the court were supposed to represent the different Hawaiian islands. And those Hawaiian islands by then had also become uh, connected to a particular color or a particular flower. So I think that's what a re this is a reference to. But again, this is artistic fantasy by a commercial artist. Two other things, two other aspects of Hawaiian culture. On the left, a canoe um, with a very graphic representation of un undersea ocean life to make it more lively and to make it more colorful. And I, I can't tell if the couple in the canoe are supposed to be tanned Haole tourists or if they're supposed to be native Hawaiians. The woman has bright red hair, so I don't think she's supposed to be Hawaiian. And on the right, a uh, representation of surfing. Uh, the man is holding a longboard, a long surfboard. That implied him being at Waikiki because Waikiki at that point in the 1950s was where most surfing was still being done. And for people in the United States, surfing was still very much associated exclusively with the Hawaiian Islands because surfing was not very popular yet in other places like Australia and California. And the airlines, of course, as I said earlier, wanted to emphasize the speed and the modernity and the technological superiority of the planes that they were using. They were using the most modern, up-to-date planes. So both of these illustrations, Pan American on the left and United Airlines on the right, show aspects of their airplanes. The picture on the right is very similar to the ones that I showed you earlier of the couples arriving and being greeted, same situation with the airline, with the airplane in the background. But on the left is a complete fantasy view of a woman passenger sitting in a airline seat looking out the window of an airplane and no airplane at that time had windows of that size, certainly not airplanes that were being used by Pan American. And she's looking out at a view, aerial view of Diamond Head and Waikiki. Well, even today, <laughs> no large airplane, passenger airplane, flies in this direction over Honolulu. So again, and certainly not at this altitude. So that again is a fantasy view to get across the idea of, look, in, in comfort, you look out on this beautiful Hawaiian vista. Again, artistic license, it's not true to life. And here are some other examples of the the showing off of modern airplanes. Now notice, in the 1950s, all of these are propeller airplanes. Jets, passenger jets, were not yet in service in the United States when these three pieces were published for both United Airlines and Pan American. And those four-engine planes 
were a lot faster than the previous ones. I mentioned in the 1930s, it took 17 to 19 hours. Well, by the 1950s, that had been cut down to a little more than nine hours. So that was considerably faster, but it's still by our standards today, a very long trip, particularly between here and the West Coast of the United States. So it was jets being introduced in 1959 on this route that made a huge difference in tourist numbers, in the amount of people coming here, et cetera. This is all before that time. And now I wanna show you the level of which this printed material was created and given out to passengers. Nothing like this occurs today. At the time in the 1950s, a long trip by airplane was still special for most people. Most people had never done it. And so on that plane, on that airplane, or on that flight, you got a lot of printed material that you could keep as souvenirs if you chose to. So both of these are menus. These are in-flight menus. They're large. They're large size menus. And everybody got one of these printed menus who was on this flight. That's, that doesn't occur anymore. You may get a menu today in first class, but you certainly don't get it any place else in, a, in an airplane. But again, look at how much time and energy went into creating and printing all of these just as an amenity for passengers to look colorful and to look attractive. And again, as I said, maybe be kept as a souvenir. This is the cover of the information packet that would be in the seat pocket in front of you on a United Airlines plane during the 1950s. And again, this is commissioned artwork, created unique artwork by an artist just for this. Nobody today would spend money on this type of either commissioning this type of artwork or printing it and distributing it. It's just a cost that nobody would think to do anymore today. And as I said earlier, this is, this is something again that, that really shows you how much of this they did. Both of these are baggage tags given out by United Airlines. They could serve, you could write on the other side, you could write your name and address. So they could be identification, identification tags, but they're basically there to be pretty. And they're basically there for you to put on your suitcase as advertising for United Airlines, and also to show to other people who see your luggage that you went on this major wonderful trip and that you're a sophisticated traveler. And United also did this for the ticket envelopes that you were given to hold your ticket. Each of these is the cover of a ticket folder or ticket envelope. And again, at no point today would any airline consider printing special envelopes just for the trip to Hawaii. But it was still such a special thing in those days that this was created. And I wanna point out that the ticket envelope on the far right was designed and executed by somebody who very who became very well known here in the Hawaiian Islands. That is Herb Kane. Herb Kane, while he was local, uh, his parent, his father certainly was from here, he was born in the Midwest. He grew up in the Midwest. He became a commercial artist and worked in Chicago, but he longed to return to his father's homeland. And so for United Airlines, he was occasionally able to do some of this Hawaiian artwork. Herb moved here permanently in about 1970 and became deeply involved in Hawaiian culture and was one of the creators of the Polynesian Voyaging Society, which launched the long distance canoe, Okulea in 1975 and started this entire long distance canoe travel revival. Well, that ticket envelope dates from before her had moved back and was deeply involved again in Hawaiian culture. Something that began to happen increasingly in the 1950s with this commercial material, they began to shift away from the commercial artwork that I've been showing you and shift to using photography instead. And for many years now, 
whatever promotional material and advertising stuff we see, which today is not very often on paper, but is usually online, it's almost always exclusively photographs. Well, here are two examples, early examples of 1950s photographs. And uh, the one on the left, interestingly, is, is, a, is a surfer explaining to two female tourists, apparently, how to surf based on his, his hand motions or the positions of his hands. And on the right is a picture taken at the Coco Palms Hotel on Kauai. Two tourist couples, one in the canoe and one standing on the shore. But notice that there's also a Hawaiian woman in there or a local woman, but she's kind of subservient as we often see. She's fixing a, a hibiscus flower in the hair of the seated female tourist. And there's a lot you can read into that. And let me, there we go, sorry, I got a little glitch there. So by the 1960s, two big changes. One, the brochure on the left is advertising, as you can see, uh, tours to Hawaii in 1960. But that little airplane at the top, that little United airplane above the Waikiki scene, that's a jet. So now jet travel has started and jet travel was going to increase tourism tremendously in the 1960s. And in the 1960s, again, a continuation and an enlargement, if you will, of the use of photography, as you see in the brochure on the right, which is from the middle 1960s. This was going to be the end of most, much of the commercial artwork that we had been seeing before that. In the 1960s, by the 1960s, Pan American World Airways was in a very interesting position in the United States. It was considered pretty much the premier airline of the USA. It was renowned internationally because it flew all over the world and it was known all over the world. And it was considered to be, again, as I said, more sophisticated than the domestic airlines because the flight attendants came from other countries. They had, uh, Pan American was established in multiple countries and it had been for years. So it had an allure or a mystique connected to it. And in the picture on the left, you can see these well-dressed people getting off a Pan American jet in the background. And now they've come to arrived in Honolulu, but as sophisticated travelers, they've probably been on Pan Am and to a bunch of places in the world. On the right, a more modern view, a more modern 1960s style artwork that's changed from the 1950s. And at the bottom of this picture of a luau with more swinging 60s people, you'll see Pan Am is the world's most experienced airline. It's not uncommon in the 1960s. If you watch a 1960s film that's about spies, it's about James Bond, it's about international things happening, it's not uncommon that there will be shots of a Pan American jet landing or taking off included in a Hollywood film because Pan American was so well known for its international flights. However, the mighty do not always stay in a position on top. And Pan American amazingly enough to me and to others who are of my age, shut down in 1991. It no longer exists and it hasn't existed for many years. And many people won't even remember it for that reason. But there are those who still do remember the name of Pan Am and the logo with fondness because of what it used to represent. And so of these two, Pan American has long since dropped out of the picture, but United Airlines is still flying here. And of the two, United is the one that's managed to hang on longer and is therefore more successful. And this is a, again, a, a late example of commercial artwork. This actually is a three-dimensional object that was created. This is probably paper. This is probably hand-cut paper that's been glued onto as, as a large piece, which has then been photographed and reduced for this version that you, that you see here. And that type of commercial artwork would going to, is going to be going away. Um, and again, is almost non-existent now. 
And this dates from about 1970. So that brings us to the end of this look at how two competing airlines chose to represent Hawaii and Hawaiian people in Hawaiian culture for their customers. And I like to show these things to people because most of you who are watching this have never seen them before. And yet at the time, they were very familiar to a great many people. I think it's important that we need to know where we came from and how we got here and how these things have evolved. So that's the end of this episode of How Did We Get Here? I'm DeSoto Brown. You're watching Think Tech, and I will be watching for you on another one of the shows that I'll be doing in the future for Think Tech. Until then, aloha, everyone.